certainly very happy to see as many out tonight after me keeping you until midnight last night. <laughs> um, I didn't think you'd all be out today, but looks like you're going to come out to Sunday school, and that's very good. Now, we're studying and trying to just take our time upon this church doctrine, and uh, I just teach it. Now, there may be some strangers with us that I don't know. I'm not here in a tabernacle enough to know who is the members of the church, but I'd announce that this would just be the members of the church because out people have so many different doctrines and so forth. Well, it, uh, they believe those things. They've been taught to believe them. And, and, um, and then when you come into another church, maybe and it teaches something very contrary, well, then they think, say, I don't agree with that, see? Well, we don't mean to be rude or to hurt anyone. The reason we do this, now, you believe whatever you wish, but we are, I'm placing this and have to make it real strong because we have to clinch it down. This is what the tabernacle stands for, see? This is what we stand for here. And that way we wouldn't want you to feel offended and think that we were trying to hurt you and your belief or anything like that. That's not at all. And this is a, we go through this about ever two or three years around here and what we stand for just the doctrine what we stand for and why we do it what why we believe this and um so uh if there be strangers here who is not uh, a member of the church we're certainly glad to have you to study on this discussion this morning and also tonight and then wednesday there will start a regular campaign in, in the meeting. Uh, I mean, at the tabernacle here. And I've been away for a while on a little rest. I got real, real tired and had to go away to rest a while. And uh, I just got back, feel fine, feel wonderful. And um, so uh, I'll be leaving again as soon as this is over and won't be back anymore till January. I'm not going to any meetings. I'm just going away to continue the rest that I was on. But when we come in, we found the church kind of in a little upset here and there, and some of the members have begin to kind of get a little lukewarm, pull away, holding little enmities against each other and so forth like that. I went around from one to the other till we got this all straightened up now. It's all right. And there's nothing wrong. There was nothing wrong with any of the members. There ever one fine man and women. If they could just realize that that's the devil gets between the people. That's exactly right. It's not the people. If you can let a brother see that, then he won't hold him until he gets the other fellow. He'll, he'll feel bad. He'll feel like, well, that's, uh, uh, I feel sorry for my brother. See, if he did do wrong, why, well, it wasn't the brother. It was the devil that did that. You say, well, this guy did a certain, certain thing. Your brother didn't do that. Your sister didn't do that. That was the devil got into them that did it. So don't blame the brother. The sister blamed the devil. That's the one who caused it. And um, so now in these church doctrines, now they may be very uh, odd to you. They may be that you wouldn't agree with them at all. But uh, we just, that's what we believe. We believe it because it's in the Bible and we teach it that way. Now, last night, our subject was, why are we not a denomination? Now, we are an organization because we're a church. But we are not a denomination. And then I was given the reasons why we are not a denomination. Now, as we open the discussion this morning, before we do so, let us pray. Dear God, it's into thy holy presence that we come again to ask the cleansing of our own minds, our souls, that we might present ourselves to thee as an instrument in which you could work in and through to your own glory. And Father, cleanse my thoughts and my mind and my speaking, that it might not be me that does the speaking, but the Holy Spirit might anoint the lips uh, and the, of clay, that it might bring forth the truths that God Almighty would have His church to know. And we would ask you then, Lord, if you do that, that you would move back every demon of, of trouble and every demon of envy and malice away from the people that they might hear the Holy Spirit speak. 
that God may receive glory out of our gathering together this morning. And if there be one thing in our hearts that's not just exactly in condition that where you could speak to us, oh, God, cast it away from us as far as the east is from the west. For we would know only the will of God to do. So lead us by thy Holy Spirit in this coming discussion upon church and its doctrine and what it should stand for and why it should stand for thus. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, last evening we were giving the, the thought of why we was not a organized uh, a denomination. And we, just a little backgrounds for this, is because we find that in a denomination it draws a barrier. Now, we've got many things to discuss, and we discussed it why we did not accept women ministers in the church last night. And this morning, we want to, uh, the subject, if we possible, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and why we believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and how the baptism of the Holy Spirit comes, and what it does, and how it makes you act afterwards. And then tonight, if the Lord willing, I want to speak on the subject, the seed of the serpent of this in this day. Now, the people don't believe in the seed of the serpent, but it's the scripture thing. Now, regardless of now this, if I make this real strong, I'm not meaning it now to you, to you, dear people. The only thing I'm trying to do is drive it in, and we're going to make it rough. You see, so you got to speak like you say, Johnny, go sit down. <laughs> He might not listen to that, but you say, Johnny, sit down. <laughs> Johnny, pay more attention to it. So, uh, we're going to holler, Johnny, sit down this morning. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I want to speak it so that you'll understand what we're meaning. Amen. And if we say something that's contrary to your thoughts and your belief, we're not one thing. Remember that in this church being an interdenomination, we believe that Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Lutheran, Catholic, Protestant, Jew, whatever he is, as long as he is a brother, he is our brother. That's all. No matter what denomination he belongs to, God will never hold that against him being a denomination. But the reason denominations are, now here's what starts denomination. God will reveal a little something to somebody. And they'll come and make a denomination around that belief that they have. And then God can't move any farther. How could the Methodists ever accept anything more than the second work of grace? They denominate themselves. Uh, how could the Baptists ever believe any more than what they, uh, the just, uh, Luther, rather, the just shall live by faith? That's what they denominate it under. How can the Baptists go any farther than they go? But well, when you believe you receive the Holy Ghost and immersed in water and that settles it, why? That's what they're denominated under. See? Why is the Pentecost pleased that when you speak in tongues you got the Holy Ghost and that settles it? Because they're denominated under. Brother, them things may be everyone all right, but God isn't bound to any little denomination. He just spreads over the whole thing. That's all. And, and we, we believe that. And that's the reason that we have never become a denomination. Uh, the Lord has given us the opportunity to merge this little church in many different denominations, but we don't do it because we want to stay just like this so it can be under the rulership and headship of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's right. Whatever he reveals to us, and we see that it's a truth, and it lines up with his word all the way back and forth through the Bible, and it is the truth, and the Spirit is agreeing on it, we have no denominational barriers to hold us from accepting that. Amen. We go right ahead into it and move right on. And so when the denomination says that like the Church of Christ, they're under denominations, so-called Church of Christ, that days of miracles is past and all these things like that? Why, well, where would you ever find that in the Scripture? But they couldn't do nothing about it. They're denominated under that. See? So you, there's nothing you can do about it. But we want to be free where we can just move as the Spirit moves us. To our deeper depths and higher heights and just keep moving on and on and on and on and on and on. Just wherever. But now we won't accept any fanaticism. We draw a line right there. If somebody gets a little something the Lord revealed to him and it doesn't coincide with this Bible, plumb through the Bible. From Genesis to Revelation it becomes a doctrine, then we will not accept it. Amen. See, it's got to come from the Bible. 
And it can't just become with somebody's revelation. If the revelation is right with the word, all right. A man come to me some time ago, and he said, I just come to the United States, Brother Branham. He said, now I got acquainted with a Christian sister and said this Christian sister was one of the most lovely women, but said they come to find out that she had three or four husbands and said that, uh, that uh, right while I've known her since being here three months, she got rid of that one and married another one and said she had the Holy Ghost, spoke in tongues completely all the time, uh, regularly, and said uh, gave prophecies and revelations, said she's a real spirit-filled woman. And she was a lady minister. And said, I went and I asked the Lord, uh, why would such and such a thing be? Why is it that this woman could do such as this? And said, I had a dream of my wife. And my wife was having an affair with another man, which was immoral. And then said, she come and knelt down by my feet and said, will you forgive me for what I've done? He said, sure, I forgive you. And said, why do you forgive me so freely? He said, because I love you. And said, the Lord spoke back the dream and told me that that's the reason I forgive her because I love her. I said, sir, your dream was mighty sweet. It was mighty nice. But the Lord never gave you that dream. Amen. It don't cooperate with his word. Amen. That's right. It won't work with his word. No matter how real it seems, it's got to come from the word. Amen. In the Old Testament, they had three ways of knowing a message. First, of course, was the law. Next was by a prophet. Next is by a dreamer. Now, the law was a written article that was kept in the ark. And that was the commandments and the laws on the commandments. And then a prophet could prophesy. Or a dreamer could dream a dream. Which God deals both ways with prophets and with dreams. If there be one among you who is spiritual or a prophet, I, the Lord, will make myself known to him in, in, uh, in, in dreams and will reveal myself to him in visions. And if what he says comes to pass, then hear him, for I'm with him. If it doesn't, then don't hear him. Now, when they took a prophesier, prophet, or a dreamer, and they, he had a dream or a prophecy, and they wanted to find out whether that was the truth or not. They took him up to what was called the Urim of Thundum. Now, I know that may be to some, some maybe a little hard word, but what it was, was actually the uh, Aaron being the high priest over the, the 12 tribes of Israel. He had six stones on each side of a breastplate. And each stone was a birthstone of the tribe, like the tribe of Judah, the tribe of Gad, the tribe of Reuben, the tribe of Benjamin. Each one had a birthstone. And then when they burst on, it would be hanging on one of the plates in the church or the pilaster. And then when they brought this prophet who had a prophecy that he said the Lord was going to do a certain thing, and they brought him before here and he told his prophecy or he told his dream. Now, if God was in that dream or in that prophecy, them lights begin to mingle together and made like a rainbow color afflicting, an answer of supernatural. Amen. See? That's right. Agreeing with every stone in there. Every stone blending its part together, reflecting back by the answer of God, that man is a prophet. He's telling the truth. Amen. Or that dream was sent by me. But if it just stayed dormant, and didn't move. I don't care how real it seemed. It was wrong. They didn't receive it. Amen. What a beautiful illustration today. Now the Old Testament, Urim Thundum has been done away with because it changed priesthoods. Now the Urim Thundum is the Word of God, the Bible. Amen. Yes, sir. In here, the Bible said, let every man's word be a lie and mine be true. Amen. And no matter how real it seems when a man's a telling it, or how real his dream is, or his revelation is, if it, every book in the Bible, the entire Bible, doesn't reflect the light on it, that's the truth, leave it alone. Amen. Leave it alone. Now you can take a little piece of scripture here, say, Jesus did so and so, and we ought to do the same. You can make it say anything you want to make it say, but it's got to come all the way through and line up perfectly with the word of God, then it's right. That's God saying so. This is his Urim Thundum. Therefore, God never did in any age have a denomination of churches. You tell me when it was. And now, there never was a denomination until 360 years after the death of the last disciple. That was the Roman Catholic Church. And out of the Roman Catholic Church, God called her in the Bible, Revelation 17, a whore. That's an impure woman. 
And out of that, she had daughters. And those daughters were harlots, impure, like she was. That's what the scripture said. And the Roman Catholic Church gave birth to all Protestantism. And they went right back and done the very same thing that she did. And the reason that she was impure, she had a cup of doctrines in her hand, a wine of her wrath of her fornications, and she gave it to the kings of the earth, and she set over many waters and reigned over the rulers of the earth. We found that so in the Bible. We found that she was supposed to be sitting on seven hills, a church. We found it. We found that she was decked with a triple crown, Jewish dicks of hell, heaven, and purgatory. Right. And it was a man, was a ruler of it. He was the Antichrist, setting in the temple of God, showing himself he was God, forgiving sins on earth. We had all this, went through it and see that it's right. Said, here's to him that has wisdom. We find that the Spirit kept speaking expressly to him that has wisdom. To he that has knowledge, to him the different spirits, the gifts. Can't you see that God moving that church in the last days? There's got to rise a church full of the spiritual gifts. Amen. The real gifts of God. Here's to he that has wisdom. Let him count the numbers of the beast, for it's a number of a man. His number is 666. And we found where that was. Exactly. Couldn't be no more perfect. Write it out your own self. A vicarious, which is a vicar of Christ, a filia of God, vicarious, a filia of Delia. And see if it doesn't in your Roman numerals. And see if you haven't got 666. See if it don't place, not upon something else, will give you suspicion, this or that, but right at the same place where the rest of the Scripture says it'll be set. Amen. And here we are, Protestants, coming right out. Now what we're trying to do today is to bring out and show that the doctrine that the Catholic Church brought out and has, we've adopted it right over here in the Protestant Church. And we're giving that to the people, which is the same glass of spiritual fornications that she gives out. Because they're not scriptural. They're man-made. It's false prophecy. It's a lie. It's of the devil. And then we found out to get a little background to show that the age that we're living in. And picked it up last night that a, a bastard born child, illegitimate child, could not in, even come into the congregation of the Lord for 14 generations. That would be 400 years, 40 years to a generation. How horrible sin was. How horrible it not was, but what it is now. And if that was under the law and Christ come to magnify the law... He said, you've heard him say them of old times, thou shalt not kill. But I say unto you, to whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause is killed already. Magnified. You've heard him say them of old times, thou shalt not commit adultery. That was the act. But I say unto you, to whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her has committed adultery. Magnified it thousands of times. Well, if it taken 14 generations for that to fade out, then what about when the magnifying glass of God stood on it? And people today, the teenagers out in high school with beer parties and drinking and living and little girls living and adultery, little boys and things like that. What kind of a generation is coming up after this? What makes these little girls act like that? Their mammy was a flapper. Their grandmammy was a coarse girl. And he said they visit the iniquity of the parents upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. What can you expect anymore? And when the whole things begin to leak out and the righteous seed begins setting on the side, getting thinner and thinner and the wicked just keep on very religious. Just keep getting wicked and wicked and wicked and there's nothing to do but destroy the whole thing like he did back there in the Andalusian destruction. They ever thought of man is continually full of sin. Everything man thinks about today is a bottle of whiskey or some woman or out running around. Can't live true to their wives. The boys can't live true to their girls. Girls can't live true to the boys. While they're in such a place that the devil's got them so bound and possessed with evil spirits. The whole thing's become a conglomeration of sin. That's the reason we're in the day. That's the reason that Russia is playing exactly in the hands of God to rock this thing out of here. The Bible says so. Certainly God's using communism. He will use it. Communism will destroy the entire thing according to the scripture. And we're in that day. Now, bringing these things out, see, listen, people, you are facing this. 
And you, it, it, this determines your eternal destination. So don't take it something lightly. Look at it in the, the Urim Thundam. That's afflicting. How it's affecting the words. Now, when we're speaking of these things, see if they cooperate with the Bible. See if they tally up with what the Scripture says. Now, every church, as soon as you say, I'm a Christian, what denomination do you belong to? What difference does that make what denomination you belong to? We realize that denomination has nothing to do with God's Bible. And all Protestant denominations are harlots. The Bible said so. When you say you're a Methodist, you're a Methodist harlot. You say you're a Baptist, you're a Baptist harlot. When you say you're a Pentecost, you're a Pentecostal harlot. That's what the Bible said. So she is a mother of harlots. Now, if that's all you got. Now, if you're a fellowshipping in this denomination and yet a Christian, you are a Christian and you're not a Methodist. You're not a Baptist. You're not a Pentecostal. You're a Christian. Not why even the I heard a discussion this morning on the radio while I was getting ready to come to church on this Christian uh, roundtable discussion in Louisville and the churches have adopted the program of teaching their children modern drinking. What kind of a bunch of idiots are we going to produce? Why is it? Because their mammy and pap at home knows no more about God than a hot and top would know about Egyptian night. Abstain from the whole thing. You don't have to moder- make yourself modern. You make alcoholics when you do that. Oh, we'll let her do this and let him do this and so forth like that. What can you expect? We can't go another generation. We can't do it. We're at the end time. So I, I don't want you to class me as some kind of a quack. I may be. If I am, I'm just as, I'm ignorant of it. I said to my wife sitting there, I said, Meaty, have I become a religious fanatic? Have I lost my mind? Or is it the Spirit of God that can't stand those things that's crying out? Amen. Is there something in here that makes me even go against my own thinking, my own will? I said, there's only three things it can be. It can either be that I have lost my mind. If I am, I don't know it. I'm a nervous, upset person. That's just my nature. My gift does that. But as a minister... But I, I'm, I've either lost my mind, or I've become a fanatic, or it's the Spirit of God. It's, it's got to be one of those things. But I can't stand to see the things, and something inside just screams out. And yet I know according to the Bible, it's got to happen. Then what good does it do to scream out? How is God going to stand to the judgment and throw this generation up here if he hasn't got a voice for screaming against it to bring judgment? What's going to be the Pharisees if there wasn't a John to scream out of the wilderness? What good's it going to do when I tell them they shouldn't do this and shouldn't do this and shouldn't do this and you should not do this and you should be filled with the Spirit? They walk by and say, off at the head, crazy, something happened to him. Well, what's the use of doing it? Because God's got to have a voice. He's got to say it anyhow. So he can bring judgment and say, there it was, you're not ignorant of it. That's right. And if you don't cry out, what's he going to do? There's something cries out in you. You can't help it. Now, now we find out then that when we brought down the next article we have here, finding out that, that the reason we are a non-denominational, and we believe that there's born-again Christians, sainted people in Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, Pentecostal, and what more? We believe that God's church is that seed that's mixed down to this realm down through here, and it come in by... What we spoke of last night, and we'll further discuss it, predestination. Not that God predestines anything to be, but by foreknowledge He can predestinate. For you know to all things. And we found out last night that there's nobody ever got saved like tonight and had their name wrote on the Lamb's Book of Life. Your name was either put on the Lamb's Book of Life before the world began, or it never was there and never will be. We find out when God slayed the lamb before the foundation of the world, you slain with your lamb. You believe that? Find out just a minute. 
Let's turn to Revelations to begin with Revelation 17 or Revelation 13, 8. And find out here what the Bible says about, about whether when the Lamb was slain. See if it was slain in AD 33 or AD 33 or whether it was slain what, when it was slain. All right. Now this is in the United States in prophecy here. Of course, now we read this. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, what? The beast, whose names were not written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. When was the Lamb slain? 2,000 years ago? Maybe 100 million years ago. Before the foundation of the world was ever formed, Jesus Christ died for our sins. Oh, now I get religious. Before there was a world, Jesus Christ died to save it. Well, you say, then why did God, the infant God, ever permit sin? You know, there's attributes in God. And if God would have never permitted Satan, he knew when he created Lucifer. That he was to be the one to corrupt the world. Oh, our God's not something little pushed off in one corner. But he's the infinite God. Who never had a beginning or never will have an end. And in him, he is in his attributes. He is a savior. And how could he ever been known as a savior if there hadn't been something to save? How would we ever know? Which was first, as I asked the question, which was first, the savior or a sinner? Well, if the savior was first and the savior is higher than the sinner, how did the sinner ever happen to be? If there hadn't been a sinner, he would have never known him as a savior. Which is the most powerful. A healer or a sick man. The healer just takes the sickness and destroys it. Which is first, a God or a cancer? Why, there was a God first. Why did he permit the the disease then? Because if he can destroy it now, he could have caused it not to happen. And if he's infinite, he knew it would happen. But then if he doesn't, if he doesn't, if there is no disease, then he had never been known as a healer. But being that he is a healer, there had to be a disease. Hallelujah. You see what I mean? Now, he knows all things. Now, in Revelation 13, 8, listen. And the lamb was slain when? Before the foundation of the world. God in his infinite mind looking down through the streams of time and he saw what would take place and how he would have to create and drop down into this time and space to pull out what he really was. But oh, you young, you man, got your wives. Put a woman under a test and you'll see what she's made out of. That's right. Put a man under a test and he'll sh- shake a bottle under his mouth. If he's a, been an alcoholic, he'll tell you whether he got saved from it or not. If he's been a rascal, a run around, a filthy hound that broke up other man's home, strip some woman and start him and start her by him and he'll tell what he's made out of. That's right. Certainly, God to show his power, to show what he was, that he was a savior. He permitted a sinner to be here. As I said, how will the angels sing the redemption stories when they don't even know what redemption means? But we can sing it. We know what it means to be lost, what it means to be found. You never was lost. You don't know what it means to be found. It's those who are lost knows what it means. 
It's those who've had sickness that knows how to enjoy good health when he comes. Is that vile person that walked the streets under and never had a friend, and never had no one to put their arms around him, and never had nobody to even look at him and consider him? It's that person that knows what a real friend means to put an arm around him. Sure. You have to know. How will we ever know how to appreciate this sunshine if there hadn't been a night? How would you know to appreciate a pretty bright day if there never been a cloudy one? How would you know to appreciate the warm sunshine of the summer if there hadn't been a winter? The law of pro and con and getting off the preaching. I don't mean to do that. All right. Revelation 17, 8. Or we just for a minute now to show now the Lamb was slain when? Before the foundation of the world. All right. Revelation 78. And the beast which thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and shall go into perdition and they that dwell upon the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the book of life from when? The foundation of the world. When was your name put in the book of life? As I said last night, the man that wrote the song, there's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine, it's mine. Meaningly, he was right, but scripturally, he was wrong. Your name was not written the night you come to Christ. Jesus said, all the Father has given me will come to me. And no man can come except my Father draws him. Amen. All oh, that comes to me, I'll give him eternal life and raise him up at the last day. There's none of them lost. I'll lose nothing. Called. No man can pluck them out of my Father's hand who gave them to me. Oh, my. St. John 5, 24. He that heareth my words and believeth on him that sent me has eternal life and shall never come to the judgment but pass from death unto life. That's why this church believes in the security of the, the perseverance of the saints. Not in the Baptist form, not in the Presbyterian form, but in the Bible form. What do you say now, Brother Branham? Uh, I guess once in grace, always in grace, that brings a lot of disgrace. But when a man or a woman has been born to the Spirit of God, old things have passed away. All things have become new, and he's been birthed and blessed by the eternal God. Hallelujah. And they can no more perish than God himself can perish. Do you mean to tell me that a God, an infinite God, would come down and give you eternal life knowing that he was going to lose you, save you here, knowing he's going to lose you there? What did he say to you for? Why, well, he's working against himself. If he saved you once, you are saved for all eternity. There's no demons in hell could upset you. Now, the infinite God who could tell the end from the beginning and then save you here this week and knowing next year you're going to backside and lose you. Well, what's he doing to work like that for? That would be foolish. I wouldn't do that. If I made you my friend today, knowing you was going to be my enemy tomorrow, well, I wouldn't do it. I'd just let you alone. Amen. See? God makes you his servant today because he knows and knows before you ever come on the earth. When he was making the calcium, it went in your body. When he created the cosmic life that you, it's in you. When the petroleums and all that you're made up of, when God created on the earth, He knew every fiber of you and what you'd do. How can the infinite God? Well, I better walk careful today. I might backslide and be lost tomorrow. He wasn't saved at the beginning. You might be worked up under emotions. You might just think you're saved. You might feel like you're saved. 
You might believe that you're saved. You might join the church. You might be a good Baptist, Methodist, or Pentecostal. They don't have one thing to do with it. Your name's ever, if you are ever saved, you were saved before the world ever began. When God sent Jesus in his mind to save that one who he saw was savable. Now, he's not willing that any should perish. He's not willing. But if he's God, he knows who would and who would not. The scripture says so. So there you are. That's why we differ with the Baptists, the Methodists. And the so-called Calvinistic thinking people. But Calvinism's right. Then we're going to come over on the Armenian side. What do they get? Works. That's the holiness groups. Works. That's God, I'll let my hair grow out to women. And all oh, praise God, I won't even wear a short sleeve shirt. The man will and so forth like that. That has nothing to do with the kingdom. No, sir, you can... Let your hair grow long. You can wear dresses whatever you want to or you can do this, that, or the other and it won't have nothing at all to do with it. You're not saved because of your clothes. If so, God would just have made some patterns of such. Jesus wouldn't have had to die. You're saved because of God saved you by grace. And you do these things just in appreciation. Common decency will tell you that. You do those things in appreciation. Works is what I do for God. If I never preach another sermon and live your 150 years, I'm still saved. Sure. I'm not saved because I'm a preacher. I'm saved because it's a grace of God that saved me. There wasn't one thing I could do to merit it. I'm sued at the law right now for half a million dollars. And they said, why, you went up. The money that you're taking up out there to pay your bills, it was yours before you paid your bills. You passed it to your church, but it was yours first. I said, but I never done one thing for it. Said, yes, you did. Said, you told them that you'd take up a love offering. I said, I want someone to tell me when it was. Well, you solicited the mail. I said, search my office. Not a penny. You know, the Bible said, don't take no thought what you shall say. For it will be given to you in that hour. And they're sitting there with those federal attorneys. And each one busting again to me from one side to the other. Me hardly know my ABCs and with those smart men who's trained to make you say things. That you really don't mean to say it. Now how can you match wits with someone like that? You can never match the wits with my master, though. This scripture said, don't you take no thought when you're brought before kings and rulers. I know the money that I've taken up there, I'd spend it for them. And they didn't dispute that. It had been spent just as legitimate as it could be. But they said, it was yours first. And then you turned it to the Branham Tabernacle. I said, but uh, I am the treasurer of the Branham Tabernacle. And this... Well, I said, I don't know about that. Then why didn't the trustees do this, that, the other? One, I said, and then you call me dishonest? I said, we didn't think you're very honest. I said, I want to show you something, Mr. Brennan, that attorney. I'm just saying this for the glory of God now only, and especially for the young. He said, I want to show you something. To show you how if you live by the Bible, God will live by you. And if your spirit disagrees with what God says, then you're not living by the Bible. Remember last night when we talked about women preachers? When they said, well, I believe the Holy Ghost called me to preach and so forth like that. The Bible said, if any man says that he's a prophet or even spiritual, let him acknowledge that this is the commandments of the Lord. But if he's ignorant, just let him be ignorant. So when you hear a man say that they believe in women preachers... It shows that they're not right with God or don't know the truth. That's the truth. Scripture says so. We found it there. Coinciding to the Scriptures. Now, no matter how real it looks, it's a contrary. It's not right. Now, we're going to get something here now. Notice, God the infinite God who made the earth and the heavens and knowed all things. And 
knew it before the world was ever formed, ever flee, ever fly, ever net, everything that would ever be. If you live by his word, then standing there, but those attorneys, this attorney walked over there and said, we are not by no means trying to say that you're dishonest. Said you were ignorant of the fact that when anyone gave you money, it was yours first. Said you signed a check from Mr. Minor Oregon back from, uh, from California of the Christian businessman's full gospel fellowship for so many thousands of dollars. And the same day you took it out of your bank and bought four or five tickets for an overseas trip by $24,000. Said, yes, sir. He said, you owe income tax on that. Well, I said, we stood right in the same bank. And he gave me the check and I passed it into the bank and wrote the tickets right back. He said, if you had the check one minute, said half of that was yours. You had it a half a minute, it was yours a half a minute before it became the church property. That you owe income tax on. That he gave it to the church. He paid income tax on it. He gave it to the church. He gave it to you. And I said, you pay income tax on it. It goes to the church saying it's untaxable. That we're not taxing your church. We're taxing you. I said, then... Well, I said, the very man that signed his name, the federal income tax, told me to do it this way. He said, he's not with the government anymore. I said, they who wrote the Constitution is not with the government anymore. Is it still stands? I said, someday you'll not be with the government anymore. And what are you saying then? I said, what kind of a government are we serving? Certainly. But then, and the other man said, Mr. Branham, he said, we find here, let me show you, we know where every penny that you spent is. I said, all right. He said, here is a place where you was having a meeting in Canada and Alberta. And in there, you was given a love offering of $3,000. I said, yes, sir. And said, the following Sunday previous rather to that, you went out and found where there's an old church. And they were worshiping this church and had no roof on it. And you give that $3,000 to them people to build a church. I said, that's right. Said, but you owe income tax on it. Said, you gave it to the church. Said, see, it was yours for it was the church's. He said, isn't it the truth that a certain man, and I won't call his name because many of you know him, his house burnt down here in the country. And you'd come in off your meeting and you had $1,500. Now, that may sound a whole lot of money to one of you all, but that's just 15 days for me to loaf or rest. Cost me over $100 a day whether I preach or whether I don't. To take care of the office and things. And said so you had $1,500 and that man was house burnt down. He had about six children and you gave him that $1,500. Sure, they had my check laying here. I said, that's right. I said, what would you do? A man with five children living in a tent in zero weather and snow on the ground. You think I could sit in a decent house? And know that that man and them little children out there freezing and coke stuff around them with money could have helped him. He said, isn't it true that a man died in an alley up here and he come from Kentucky. He didn't even have money for his funeral service. And you buried the man and you and your wife took money and went down to J.C. Penney's, folded out the checks, Said you spent over $200 just for clothes for those children. I said, that's right. He said, isn't it a fact that an old woman right here in this certain city, if it was in there, New Albany, and said you gave her 300 and something dollars to pay a back grocery bill that they cut her off on, and you paid nearly $500 for her rent that they're going to set her out in the winter, and you paid up her, her rent till the following June, and also stood good for her grocery bill, which mounted up to fourteen or fifteen hundred dollars again. I said, I remember the case well. An old mother, eighty years old, with a thinking daughter and a preacher boy in Georgia, 
afflicted by rheumatism and laying on a bed and no other support, what would you do about it? I said, yes, I did. Said, did your trustee board know this? I said, no, sir, they didn't. Did your wife know this? I said, no, sir, she didn't. So then why did you do it? I said, because my Lord said, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. I said, if you got any law higher than God's laws? And just then the Holy Spirit came to the rescue so beautifully the way he does it. You say things subconsciously, not knowing you're saying it, if you just let the Holy Spirit do the talking. I said, well, um, well, if you claim that I owe that, I said, I'll do the best I can. I said, I'm no boy no more, but I'll do my best to pay it. I said, don't owe anybody anything as a Noah. I've tried to be honest. I went thousands of dollars in debt and paid it back at a dollar a week. But by God's grace, I've got it paid. I said, if you claim and prove to me that I owe that money that I give those people, and they went ahead to show us nearly $20,000 in the last 10 years to give away like that. And he said, the trustees know nothing about this. I said, it wasn't necessary for them to know it. And so he said, uh, well, uh, then he said, I said, what hurts me is to know that those poor old widows and orphans, they'll have to pay income tax on it too or die owing the government. I didn't know what I was saying. That was a father speaking and I didn't know it. Oh, he said, no, they'll not have to pay income tax on it. I said, why won't they have to pay it? said, you see, that was an unsolicited gift. Then the Holy Spirit woke me up. Oh, I said, then an unsolicited gift is not taxable? said, that's right. I said, then I don't owe the government anything. (laughs) For I never took an offering in my life. Then my attorney raised up and he said, Mr. Branham, can you? I said, I can have you two million letters. Washington to prove that. I said, I never took an offering. He said, but when you go out in these meetings and this money that's taken up by these ministers and pays off this, said, you have some kind of an understanding that you're going to get something. I said, not a thing. He said, then, well, don't you uh, uh, slice to the mail? I said, not a thing. He said, how do you get your money? I said, what well, people send me. I'm looking in the face of people right now that sends me tithings continually. I never asked them. They just do it. That's the Holy Spirit. He's able to take care of his own. Yeah. And he said, well, then, Mr. Brown said, uh, can you prove that? Can you get me letters for at least eight or ten years back that you received offers without soliciting? I said, as many as you want. He said, I want three out of each year. I said, all right, you'll have them. He said, then, will you give to me your post office box key? And let me, let your mail accumulate for two or three days and then go down to open it myself? I said, you can do anything you want to. You can come to my office also. He said, what kind of soliciting do you do? I said, nothing. What do you send out in mail? Prayer clothes. Do you charge for it? I said, come read the letters I sent with them. That was it. Now the government owes me for all I've paid income tax for the past 20 years. (laughs) Take no thought what you shall say. For it's not you that speaks. It's the Father that dwells in you that doeth the speaking. That's why we believe in staying with the Word. It may be a long time, but it'll work out just right according to the Word. Now, that's why we believe that the Bible tells us that before the world was ever formed and before it came into existence, that the Father slayed the Lamb. And then when He slayed the Lamb, He put every one of His oncoming children's name in the book of life. And we just live up to that age till it's all finished. You see what I mean? The infinite God knew that. That before the world began, he seen the program, what it had to be done, and he just made it. I remember as a great master builder, the father, 
When he made this world and put calcium, potash, and petroleum and all these different elements that goes in to make up our bodies, he knew every bit of it and knew what kind of a form and body that would have before it was ever created. Certainly he knew the eternal destination of it. And he knew what kind of spirits would inhabit these. And now, before we can finish that subject, we'll have to pick it up tonight in the seat of the serpent and in the seat of the woman and bring it down and show you why it is. See how that seat of the serpent moved down? How that seat of the woman moved down? How that seat of the serpent began to predominate, predominate, get greater and greater, 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 until now there's nothing left but just a little small remnant of names still left written from the foundation of the world. But when the body has been formed and that last name that's on the book will be recognized here on earth the books are closed for it is completed the story of redemption has been read completely then we go to see him and to meet him in the resurrection he that heareth my words and believeth on him that has sent me has eternal life and shall never come to the judgment but has passed from death unto life. No man can come to me except my Father draws him. And it's not him that willeth or him that runneth. It's God that showeth mercy, said the Scripture. It's not him that willeth. A lot of people say, I'll join church. I want to be a good guy. I'll do this. That has nothing to do with it. It's God that showeth mercy. Now, you see, when God began in, there are seven spirits of God. Just like the seven colors in the rainbow. And did you ever notice a three-cornered piece of glass reflects seven perfect colors? Did you ever try that? Set a three-cornered piece of glass. Yet it's only one piece of glass. But in three corners will reflect seven colors. That's how Father, Son, and Holy Spirit being one yet reflect the seven spiritual attributes of God. And then the first great spirit of God, which is love. God like the great rainbow. We couldn't imagine what he looks like. But he say he looks like the rainbow, them spirits. The perfect spirit of love, red. Blue, the perfect spirit of fellowship. Just all those perfect spirits. And then they begin to condensing, coming down. And they come all the way down from uh, a filial love or gopho love to filial love. And on down to lust and down to the lowest. And then God himself become a man, Jesus. And came down that same way to the lowest pits of hell. And picked out those who he knew before the foundation of the world whose names were written on the book and redeemed them back to himself. There you are. The story of redemption cannot be fully known until we see him and we stand in his likeness. Now that's why we're not a denomination. That's why we do not Cooperate, we cooperate in every move that we can for God, but that's why we are not a denomination. Amen. Now, out of the denomination comes them false things. Now, as like I said, I'm punching hard because I want it to stick. Amen. Now, out yonder in somebody else's church, I wouldn't think of these things. I'd be Christian and brother enough just to stay on the great principles which we all agree on. See? But it's just... It's just like we don't want cheating. I was speaking to a young boy yesterday where I was squirrel hunting yesterday morning way down in the mountains of Kentucky. And I didn't notice the little posted sign in the woods. And I was sitting on the other side and I thought it was Brother Banks here coming up to the woods. He was squirrel hunting too in the same territory. And I seen him come along and I whistled at the young man. I thought it was Brother Woods dressed just like him. He turned around and I seen it wasn't him. And Brother Woods had told me that there's a place up there was posted. I didn't know it. There's no line fences, just the woods. And how will I know which hickory tree belongs in which side? So I was sitting there listening to the squirrel bark. 
And I was thinking about, well, now, tonight I go home and start the meeting. I get back in the harness again. And I, it started raining and the storms were blowing. And I seen this fellow and I spoke to him. Went up there and found out that I was on his ground. See? And I talked to him. He said, oh, that's all right. He said, my, just hunt anywhere you want to. And I said, well, he said, you wasn't on my ground. You set me on that hickory tree. Said, on this side of the hickory tree is my ground. But says, it doesn't matter, Brother Branham. Hunt wherever you want to. Come on up to the house. Pappy would like to see you. And I said, well, we got to talking about the Bible. Then when we were on hunting subject, he said this. He said, Brother Branham, there's nobody down here cares for anybody hunting. But said, my daddy was out here one day and some city hunter come out and killed one of his sheep that weighed about 60 or 70 pounds. And he hollered at the guy and the guy shot at him with a rifle. He said, that's what makes it bad. He said, we don't care for hunting. Well, that's the same thing that I'm speaking of. I don't care what denomination you belong to, but stay with the Bible, yeah. with the Holy Spirit. It isn't your denomination that we're worried about. Just as soon belong to one as the other. But it is staying with the Bible or accepting man-made dogmas. Stay with the Bible. Now, they brought forth the nomination, which was wrong. Now, the next thing they had brought forth, which was the era, was water baptism. Water baptism, as taught in the Bible, is by immersing. But the Catholic Church brought forth sprinkling or pouring. And there is no scripture in the Bible to support sprinkling or pouring. No such a place found in the Bible. It's by immersing. Well, then when along came after the Catholic Church and the Lutheran Church with their pouring, and along came the Anglican Church and so forth as it come down. Then after a while, the Baptists come in and the Camelite to get back to immersing again. Well, Satan seen that, so he just give them a false name to immerse in. And they started using the name of the Father and Son and Holy Ghost. There's not one speck of scripture in the Bible where anybody was ever immersed in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And ever who teaches it is a false teacher. And I told you, I make it stick. Now, if you don't think that's right, I want your question on this platform showing me. If you can show me one place where anybody was ever baptized in the Bible in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, I'll put a sign on my back as a false preacher and go up and down the streets crying to the top of my voice with my hands up a false teacher. There's no such a thing. Where did it come from? Now, go back. This is this side of the Bible. You have to get the history. The Catholics believe in many gods. And they broke down the one true God into three different gods. And he hear me. What a horrible thing was in the paper the other day concerning a great man that we all know to be a servant of God. Billy Graham. We have the statement. Brother Beeler there has it. When it was asked Billy Graham by certain who, what was this great contradiction about the Trinity? Was there three gods, three actual gods, or how was it? One place looked like three gods and one looked like this one. Billy Graham said, it hasn't been revealed. Nobody knows. My. If there is three gods, we are heathens. Like the Jews said, which one of them is your God? The Father, is the Son your God, or is the Holy Ghost your God? There's only one God. And those are not three personalities. For a personality has to be a person. It can't be a personality without being a person. You know that. 
How can anything be a personality without being a person? Or said, we don't believe in three personal gods. We believe in three personalities of the same God. Well, before it can be a personality, it has to be a person. What is it then, you'd say? It's not three gods. It's three offices of the same God. Amen. He was the Father in the beginning. It hung over the, the wilderness in, in the flame of fire, the burning bush. Fatherhood. God, just as a God through sin, common sin coming down. That was the highest order. The Spirit. The, the, the Agapo. The Zoe. The, the life of God Himself made in the form of a pillar of fire. And that same one, after being in the fatherhood, became the Son and the Spirit of the, was in the burning bush, was in the man Christ. And it brought forth the same evidence that the fire did. He said, if I do not the works of my Father, don't believe me. Every tree will bear record of its own fruit. And then after it become man, see it dropped down from supernatural into something tangible that could be touched. A body. And through the sacrificial death and the supreme sacrifice of this one God, Jesus, He said, I and my Father are one. Amen. My Father dwelleth in me. Can, and no one could read that any plainer. They said, why don't you show us the Father? And it'll, it'll satisfy us. John 14, 8. He said, I've been so long with you, you don't know me. He said, when you see the Father, when you see me, you see my Father. As a lady once jumped up, she said, "Why, well, Brother Branham, she said, you know, the Father and the Son are one just like you and your wife are one. I said, oh, no, they're not. I said, do you see me? She said, yes. I said, do you see my wife? She said, no. I said, then they're not the same kind of one. Jesus said, when you've seen me, you have seen the Father. The Father dwelleth in me. My wife don't dwell in me. See? They are one in every way. They are one. And we're one through agreement, wife and I. We're one in fellowship, but we're two personalities. My wife can do one kind of thinking to me another. And we're two persons, but not so with God. They, God and Christ is the self-same per person. Amen. Then what's the Holy Ghost? The Holy Ghost is that same Spirit of God dwelling in the people whom He has died for and put their name on the Lamb's Book of Life, which they were one with Him in the beginning, the Scripture says so. Amen. Did not Jesus tell them that they were with Him before the foundation of the world? Yes. Your minds are blackened and dark, and we all are to those things. But we're just not some little coincident happening here. We are sons and daughters of God in the beginning of the creation of God. Been dropped down here for a witness. To witness the grace of God that shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. We have an eternal spirit. No one. No one. And there's no way to stop it. God's church will be there just as sure as it can be sure. If we were speaking to pick up the little subject again just for, for a minute. How the illegitimate child could not enter the kingdom for 14 generations, 400 years. And how that the iniquity of the parents' visit to the children to the third and fourth generation. Also the righteousness of the parents was visited. What you do if there is a coming tomorrow and you have a great grandson, your action today will determine what he'll be then. For we read in the Bible, or that Melchizedek, when he met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings, and Abraham the patriarch gave him a tenth of tithings of all he had. And then he said that of tithings, 
that just only Levi could accept tithes. But he said Levi who received tithes paid tithes when he was yet in the loins of Abraham. Oh, can you catch that? Abraham was Levi's great grandson. And your Levi, at least eight or ten hundred years later, maybe, several hundred, I wouldn't notice what many had had to figure it up to the generation, but Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac begot Jacob. Jacob begot Levi. And your Levi, Jacob would be his father, Isaac his grandfather, and Abraham his great grandfather. And when Jacob was in the loins of Abraham, the Bible said he paid tithes to Melchizedek. Man, this young generation running around smoking, drinking, and everything. How do you expect another generation to exist? The reason we got sin, the juvenile delinquency now, the reason we got little girls on the street, little boys, is because their mothers and daddies did what they did in their bygone age. And the reason we still got preachers who will stand for truth, the reason we still got some old-fashioned girls is because they had old-fashioned parents back behind them. That's exactly right. We still got preachers that stands uncompromising with any denomination or the word is because that we had old-fashioned preachers in the back stood right on the same grounds. Yes. Now we're in this day. And now we want to say that in here back to this, some of the denominations, the reason we're not a denomination and because if we were a denomination, we'd have to bow down to that. And remember, you search the scriptures wherever you please. And you'll not find one place in the Bible where anybody was ever baptized by sprinkling, by pouring, or in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So if it's not in the scripture, it had to start somewhere. As I say, sitting under a big tree looking at it. It, or it may be like a, a masculine. It, it may be a gigantic. It may be powerful. But it had a beginning. It had to start. And everything. This old time religion that we so gallantly stand for. It had to start somewhere. It had to have a beginning. And the isms that we have, it had to have a beginning. And the false scriptures that we're using in our denominations had to have a beginning. And if we say, I'm a Methodist, you had to have a beginning. If you say, I'm a Baptist, you had to have a beginning. You say, I'm Catholic, you had to have a beginning. You say, I'm a born-again Christian, you had to have a beginning. You had to have it. Go back. Find out where it began at. Let us go back to the beginning of the picture. Then if there is no denomination in the Bible, then denomination had to have a beginning. It started with the Catholic Church. The Protestants just all sprang from it. Then if the Bible said that she was a ill-famed woman because her doctrine, she committed spiritual fornications. What is fornications? Remember, we went through it now. A woman living with her husband. She's the same as a virgin. She's never been defiled as long as she lives with that one man. But what is unrighteousness? Righteousness perverted. Let her live with another man and she's doomed. See? Righteousness perverted. Now, if the nomination was wrong... If it had been right, God would have said, now we're going to have denominations. And if the Catholic Church was pronounced in the Bible as a whore, unrighteous because she was given to her congregation her own theology and not the Bible. 
brother, sister. Doesn't the Catholic Church laugh in your face about the Bible? They say they don't care what the Bible says. It's what the church says. What their denomination says. Well, then how can you call them wrong when you knock down to a baptism of Father, Son, Holy Ghost when the Bible condemns it? Because the Methodists say so, the Baptists say so. Why will you agree to sprinkling and pouring when there's no such a thing in the Bible? There's no such a thing as anybody baptized in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. And why do you do it? See, that's why we're not a denomination. We don't have to cater to them. We take when the Spirit shows a light on the Scripture. We stay with the Scripture and thus saith the Lord. There you are. There's no such things as that. It's not written in the Scripture. Oh, you say about Matthew 28, 19. Now, we've combed through that a dozen times. That was an issue that Jesus said. Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Was it ever carried out? Was there ever a person ever baptized that way? Not one. Then there must be something wrong somewhere. Sure, it's Catholicism did it. Find out if there was ever in the history up to the Ananias and Fathers, you historians. Read the books of the Ananias and Fathers and see, come on to the King of England. Every one of them baptized in the name of Jesus Christ until the Catholic Church. And the Catholic Church has power, they said, to change anything they want to. And they went to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Martin Luther brought it out. John Wesley followed it. And Alexander Campbell come with that. And John Smith of the Baptist Church followed on. Here's Pentecost on with it yet. But the hour has come. Watch the candlesticks. As we was on last night. The first candlestick is light. It went darker, darker, darker. It went through the 1,500 years of dark ages. Then start lighting up. And just before the last church age, she lit back again. In between the two church ages, the light come. Follow the scriptures of the Ephesian church. Thessalonica church. On down to the dark age. Each one of them, he said, you have a little strength, but you haven't denied my name. And the next church, you've done a great thing, but you haven't denied my name. Follow the Ananias and fathers down through that. You haven't denied my name. And then 1,500 years of dark ages, then the Lutheran church came out. He said, you don't have my name, but you have a name. Not more, Lord Jesus, but Luther and Catholic and Baptist and Presbyterian. You have a name that you're living. We're a living church. We're thriving. We're going on. But ye are dead. Scripture said so. For there is not another name given under heaven among men, whereby a man may be saved. Not Baptist don't save you. Presbyterian don't save you. Catholic don't save you. Jesus saves you. All in the little textbooks, man-made theories. Put them down. That's what we believe. And that's the reason we stay away from it. We have no textbook but the Bible. No leading, no bishop but the Spirit. That's right. And then if there's a wrong spirit comes in, it'll try to twist something in there. The word will untwist it. Amen. That's wrong. Stay away from it. See? Here come the spirit along saying, that's wrong. Bears record. For our spirit bears record with his spirit. Here come one along saying, oh, we should. Oh, I think it's all right for him to do this, that, that. But the spirit says there's something wrong with that. It goes right back in the Bible and brings it right down way into it. And it's wrong. Stay away from it. That's the reason the Bible said, here's to him that has wisdom. Here's to him that has knowledge. Here's to him that has this. The church there sitting in order. Don't you see the great plan of God? Amen. Now look. The Philadelphian church age was the Methodist church age. The church age of brotherly love, the Reformation, which one ranked Calvinism had sprung up in the Anglican church in England where they didn't even have no revival no more. Went plumb off into hayseeds. God raised up John Wesley as a legalist to take the Armenian doctrine. And when he did, he knocked that thing in the head and it deserved to be but what did he do? Here come the Methodists along and run just as far that way as he, the Calvinists did this way. Uh, now, in between there, still Methodists, still Baptists. Wish we could get over here now in the Scriptures. Take Revelation 3, and you'll get it. Now, just before the last church age, which was Pentecostal, it's a lukewarm lady of sin church age, which is rejected. 
But remember, as Jesus was seen in the cross, standing in the seven golden candlesticks, the darkest was what was farthest away from him. His right hand and his left hand. And he was to look upon as Alpha and Omega. Not the in-between, the, the Alpha and Omega as he had his hand stretched and he was Jasper and Sardestone, which was Benjamin and Reuben, the first and the last. <laughs> there he had his hand stretched. There he stood. But remember, at the going out of this, don't confuse it. For when they received these names, share of these denominations, they would die right in them same thing. Right on down. But he said, just between the Methodists and Pentecostal going out, I have set a open door before you. Yeah. There you are, the name restored again. Yeah. I have set an open door, for I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father except through me. Yeah. What is it? That open door straight, straight. If you notice it ain't S-T-R-I-G-H, it's S-T-R-A-I-T. Straight is the way. Straight as water. How? Back to the name of Jesus. What should you have? You had got a little life. You haven't denied my name. Is that any in here? They lost and went into a Catholic denomination. Come out in the Luther denomination. Come out in the Western denomination. Then you're going out into the Pentecostal land. But just before the end time, the seed's almost gone from here. It's waited out. The seed of the righteous. The seed of the serpents is accumulating faster and faster and faster, getting ready for this atomic age to be destroyed. But just before that time, I'll set a way of escape. I'll set before you an open door. Straight is this gate and narrow is this way. And there'll be just a few of them that'll find it. But broad is a way that leads to destruction. And many will be will go in there. There you are. Just before this, this great light was supposed to spring forth. I'm so glad. I just don't know how to express it. I'm so glad. Here it is. Time to close. And I've never touched the subject. I want to speak on the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I'm going to touch it anyhow for 10, 15 minutes. Now, I won't keep you three hours like I did last night. I'll try not. Now... If they've got a false water baptism, denominations are wrong. And everyone who hangs up for certain denominations is absolutely supporting the wrong thing. They're supporting what God's against. Said so in these church ages. Said so in the scripture and call them prostitutes. Because they teach for doctrine and the commandments of man. Now we, the... I went to a place not long ago to a certain man coming here writing a thesis on divine healing. And he said, the only thing about you, Brother Branham, said the people hold it against you because you go to the Pentecostals. I said, well, I'll come to yours. I said, if you'll support me in your city. He said, well, I said, I, I done tuck that up. I said, I'll tuck it to the bishop of this certain church, Methodist church. No need to pull in any punches about it. So I took it up and they said, now you see, we as a Methodist church don't believe in these miracles. Now what are you going to do? Now are you going to listen to the Methodist church and the denomination? If you are, you're a prostitute religionist. You think the Baptist church would support a campaign of such? Why? Because they're Baptists. The Bible said they are prostitutes. She brought forth her daughters and they were harlots. Why? Giving out the same kind of a doctrine, man-made doctrine instead of God's doctrine. That's why we're not denominated with the Baptists. That's why we're not denominated with the Methodists. Now, why aren't we denominated with the Pentecostals? Here you are. Exactly. A Pentecostal would have stayed where... If, if the Lutheran church would have stayed where it would begin, it would have been the Pentecostal. But they denominated, so God raised up another Pentecostal called Wesley. And so when Wesley denominated, he raised up another one called Baptist. When they denominated, then he raised up another one called Camelites. When they denominated, he raised up another one called Pentecost. 
When they denominate, he's moving on. Just watch and see. It is not God's divine program. It's not in the program of God to have those denominations. So you see, that's why we're not a denomination. Remember this. I said in the beginning, now if I hurt you, I don't mean to. This is for the church. If you're sitting along, we like to have you here. But this is what we stand for. And why we're not a denomination. Now, the denomination, to begin with, is false and false teachers. I said it would hurt, and I want it to hurt. They are absolutely false teachers. Any man that knows those things, they will stand and compromise for the Baptist, Methodist, Lutheran, or Pentecostal, knowing that the Bible teaches different, he's a false prophet. No sticking around it. Exactly. That's why I didn't join the assemblies. That's why I didn't join the oneness. That's the reason I didn't join the Baptist, Methodist, or Presbyterian. Because they're false. I don't mean they're people's faults. I mean their theology's faults. Because it don't compare with God's word. Paul said of it. He went over here. Let me show you what Paul said before we leave this water baptism. When Jesus made the issue in Matthew 28, 19... Peter, ten days later, said, Repent, every one of you, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The next time baptism is meant, when Philip the evangelist went out and preached to the Samaritans, and he baptized every one of them in the name of Jesus Christ. Paul and Peter came down, and Peter and John rather laid hands on them, they received the Holy Ghost. Then they went on up there, Peter went straight then to Cornelius' house, and when Cornelius while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on him. Peter said, we can't forbid water. See, it needs to receive the Holy Ghost like we did at the beginning. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Paul passed through the upper coast of Ephesus. He finds some Baptists. And they had, an, they had an apostle up there, an apostle of the Bible. And his name was Apollos. He was a lawyer converted. And he was proven to the people that Jesus was the Christ. By the Bible. He said the, the Messiah is supposed to do certain things. This man was the Messiah. And they had a big bunch of people there. And they were rejoicing and shouting and having a big time of it. Aquila and Priscilla had, had went over there and joined up with him. Having fellowship with him. They didn't have no denomination. Just having fellowship. And so they seen this man was a great man. Oh, he's smart. An attorney. He was, he was a smart man. So they said, now, you, you're very good on what you know, but we got a little brother named Paul. When he comes, he's had some experience. <laughs> he knows what he's talking about. He'll teach you the way of the Lord more plainer if you just sit and listen to him. I don't try to push something off on him because he ain't going to stand still for it. But you just, you just go ahead and listen to him. And Paul come through. You listen at him, watch him over there. He said, that's very good. But have you received the Holy Ghost, you Baptist, since you believe Oh, they said, haven't we got it? <laughs> Don't think so. <laughs> well, why? Well, how was you baptized? Oh, we've been baptized. We've been baptized. Well, who baptized you and how was you baptized? The Bible says unto what? The Greek or the original says unto how. And this says unto what? So what was you baptized? In other words, how was you baptized? We was baptized by John the Baptist, the same man that baptized Jesus Christ. Same hole of water. That's pretty good baptism, don't you think so? Looks like that'd stick all right, don't it? Looks like it'd be all right if the man that walked into the water with our Lord Jesus Christ and baptized Jesus. God sanctioned it till he come down in the form of the Holy Ghost and went into him. He said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm pleased to dwell in. Right after that baptism. Looks to me like that baptism been all right. Paul said it won't work anymore now. Won't work anymore. Well, I don't want to work anymore. See? You've got to be baptized over again. Amen. You mean that we who have been baptized, but John, that baptized Jesus, has to be rebaptized? That's right. So how must we be baptized? That in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And Paul took them out there and baptized them all over Acts 19.5. And when they heard this, they were baptized again now in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And Paul laid his hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. Amen. If Paul constrained men and women to be baptized over again in the name of Jesus Christ, 
If I preach to any other gospel, then my spirit is not right like Paul's was. Right. Let him acknowledge what I write is the commandments of the Lord. And now Galatians 1.8, Paul said, if an angel from heaven comes, a bright shining angel, what's he speaking of? A revelation. Blessed be the name of the Lord. If no matter how good your revelation is, you remember the first of our service this morning? The Urim Thundum? If something comes and reveals it perfectly, he's a liar. Amen. He's a false angel. And the man who packs his message is a false prophet. Amen. There's only one way to be baptized. That's the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. If you haven't been baptized that way, the baptistry waiting. Amen. That's right. Amen. Falsely, finding one place where anybody was ever baptized in the name of Father, Son, Holy Ghost. It's not in the sacred writings. What is it? It's a dogma that started with the Catholic Church. We can support this. We have the full of Nicene Father's doctrines. We have the history. We have Hossip's two Babylons. We have Josephus' writing. We have all the ancient histories. And Josephus wrote the time of the Lord Jesus. Hossus two Babylons wrote after that. The Ananias and Fathers wrote after that. Before the forming of the Catholic Church. And then the Catholic Church came in and pushed it all out and took over themselves. And pagan Rome was made Papal Rome. And there they brought that false baptism of water to sprinkling. And from the name of the Lord Jesus to the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. And Jesus said under the inspiration he gave them, John on Patmos... You have an aim that you're living, but you're dead. Oh, amen. Father, Son, Holy Ghost is a dying name. Yes. Let me tell you a little personal experience. Switzerland, Germany, and the places where I've been. How does fortune tellers work? How does evil spirits travel? I want you to believe me as your pastor because you're the one I'm speaking to. Devils travel in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. They cut feathers and everything else and throw spells on each other through the name of Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Call it the three high names. The mother of it is Catholic churches. They go to these little statues and kneel there and cut a feather with scissors and turn it backwards and throw spells on their neighbors and so forth where they were burnt to death and everything else for it. In Switzerland, I stood with my hands on the post like I were honest men and women died when they cut their tongues out and burnt their eyes out and everything with hot rods. That prostitute Catholic church. Not only that, but your early Anglican churches too. And your Protestant churches did the same thing. And they throw those spells by the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Your brother and pastor, I've had the the grateful privilege by the grace of God to be protected in these things Amen. but to know first handed what I was talking about where a woman had come to this church condemned me and said he's fooling with spiritualism God in heaven knows what it was all about I can't take no man I didn't, when they told me that Pig Alley in Paris was such a ill famed place how did I know I was never there but I went out there to find out if it was right or not I took two or three more ministers and went down there to those women's and things that stripped on them streets and things. It's the truth. How did I know Rome sat on seven hills? How did I know the Pope had vicarious affilia dilia? I had to take somebody else's word for it. How did I know the triple crown was on the Pope, the Jewish diction of a vicar of heaven and earth and hell? How did I know it? Until I went and seen it. How did I know there was a living God? Not under somebody's theology. Some intellectual conception of some emotional uh, period of past to an age gone by. As infidels would tell us. But one day or another, I found him and talked to him face to face. Uh, That made things different. Exactly right. Spiritualism works through Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. I stood in a meeting where those witches was working. Don't you think they won't challenge you? They stood there. They throw the table up in the air and it floated around in a guitar playing. Stand there and just want to put me out. And I said, you're wrong. 
The Spirit spoke back to them. Spirit professing to be God. Said it was God. I said it's wrong. It's a devil. They said this man is an unbeliever. I said I'm an unbeliever of this stuff. Because it's not of my Lord. This is witchcraft. This is of the devil. I said, I hear I'll try that powerful name that I've been baptized in. I said, in the name of high heavens, tell me the truth. He wouldn't even answer me. I said, in the name of the holy church, tell me the truth. He wouldn't answer me. I said, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, tell me the truth. And he wouldn't answer me. But I said, in the name of Jesus Christ, tell me the truth. He said, yes, it's wrong. God knows that's the truth. Amen. Sir, oh, faith in the Father, faith in the Son, faith in the Holy Ghost. These three are one. Amen. Devils will tremble, sinners away. Faith in the Lord Jesus, make anything shake. Amen. Yes, sir. Stay by that name. You have a name that you're alive, but you're dead. There's your church. There it is. Listen. There's one woman sitting these fine, nice-looking, beautiful women sitting in this church this morning. Young women, middle-aged women, old women. They're all fine. There's somebody's wife, somebody's daughter, somebody's sweetheart, so forth. There's ever one. There's one Miss Branham sitting here. There's ever one woman, but there's one Miss William Branham. She's the one who goes home with me. She's the one's my sweetheart. She's the one that raising my children. There's many fine churches in the world today. But there's one Miss Jesus that's bringing forth a real, true, born again creatures of God. You know what I mean, don't you? Her name's not Methodist. Her name's not Baptist. Her name's Jesus. (laughs) Miss Jesus. Sure she is. She's bringing forth people, not members of the Methodist Church. She's not bringing forth Baptist Church or Presbyterian or Catholic. She's bringing forth them born and rooted and grounded in Christ. That's her. I'm so glad that I'm with her. She's a mystical church. She don't have any denominations. She carries none of these great big fancy names and big buildings. She meets wherever the members of the body gathers together. They worship in spirit and in truth. They were predestinated before the foundation of the world. One more scripture, and I promise you I'll close. And I'll leave the rest of it till tonight. Leo, you can catch that tonight then. Let's go to Ephesians just a minute. Just read this one scripture, then I'm going to leave it with you. We find out what the Bible said now about this. I'm going to take this great teacher, Paul, which is there's never been nothing like him. He was the apostle to the Gentile church. All right, get Ephesians 1. Now we're going to close just in a minute. Listen to this, my dear friend. Listen to Paul preaching to the same kind of church that I am this morning. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of the Presbyterian church. The the what church? The will of God. Uh, To the saints, the sainted ones. Which are at Ephesus. Now remember they're scattered all over the world. But this is a group at Ephesus he's talking to. Now he ain't talking to the world. He ain't talking to local church members. He's directing this to the sainted ones. Let's see. And to the faithful in Christ Jesus. How do we get in Christ Jesus? By one spirit. We're all baptized. Living faithful. How do you know you got the Holy Ghost? We're going to get on that maybe tonight. See. All right. In Christ Jesus. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. You know, it don't take a lot of hollering. It don't take a lot of screaming. That's all right. Nothing against it. It's all right. It don't take that. It takes a, a submitted heart. Sitting in heavenly places, feasting on the things of the Spirit. And what does the Spirit feast on? Emotion? Not altogether. It brings emotion. See? But you could, you remember, you remember the vision about the rain and the wheat, the terriers? 
Remember, when the Hadidin rain, there's a little cuckleberry. He's got his head hanging down. The wheat's got its head hanging down. When the rain comes, both of them jump up and shout. Same rain. But by their fruit, you shall know them. Look, grace be unto you from, from God our Father. Now watch. According, the fourth verse now, according as He has chosen us in Him at the last revival, huh? when we become a member of the Baptist, or the Met, uh, no, as shown it before they had the meeting. <laughs> yeah, before the foundation of the world. He chose us right then. Not we didn't choose Him. He chose us. Amen. He chose us then before the foundation of the world. That we should be holy. How was we holy? Not through what we did, but what He did for us. Because we can't be. How can you make a pig a lamb? Brother Roy, you raised pigs and lambs both. You can't, you can't, you can't mix them. A the pig just, he'd get around there and eat all kinds of stuff that he can't eat. Get out on manure pile and eat a belly full. Well, you don't feel bad about that. You think that pig's just all right. He's just a good pig. That's all. But you don't see a lamb around there. He couldn't invite him over for dinner. He wouldn't come. No. What's the matter? Because he's a pig. You go tell him he's wrong. Let's go to I'm a pig. <laughs> you keep on your own grounds. <laughs> you go out there and be a holy roller if you want to. <laughs> there you are. If you love the world or the things of the world, the love of God's not even in you. Said the Amen. Now, not because I quit eating manure made me a different from a pig. See, made me not a pig anymore. That isn't it. But when my nature changed, <laughs> Amen. oh, they put a fence around. I guess they bar off. I'm not supposed to do this. <laughs> oh, no. You don't bar off nothing from this. You're just born again. That's all. You've just been changed. That's right. But if you could take the spirit out of that, of that lamb and put it into the pig, that lamb would do the same thing. The pig would do the same thing the lamb spirit in him would do. And that lamb would turn right back around and do the same thing the pig did. Now, you see you pigs where you're at? That's exactly right. That's right. See, you go on out and love the things where are. Wear shorts and do all these things. Go ahead. Show us what you are. By their fruits you shall know them. Does man gather figs off of thorns? See? No, no. You draw figs off of fig trees. You get apples off of apple trees. You get thorns off a of thorn tree. That's right. Now, listen real close now. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to his own, to his good pleasure of his, his will. Having predestinated us to the praises of his glory, of his grace, Wherein he has made us acceptable in the beloved. Who did it? Cause I quit drinking, cause I quit smoking. No, he did it. Amen. He made me before the foundation of the world acceptable in the presence of his grace. Amen. <laughs> Nothing I done, never done a thing about it. Didn't have one thing to do with it. I was a pig to begin with. I was a sinner, born in a family of drunkards, raised up on a moonshine still, sitting on a whiskey barrel. Disgraceful. That's right. Kentucky moonshiner, never wore a pair of shoes, so I was a great big boy. Hair hanging down my neck, sitting up there on a moonshine keg, making moonshine. And yet the Holy Ghost comes to me at seven years old and said, don't you touch a drop of it. And don't you fool them little old girls out there and don't you smoke a cigarette or chew a chew tobacco. Oh, my. Well, I said, the Father's good will before the foundation of the world that he would send me to preach the gospel and lead his sheep. God bless him and forever that great name. I'll stay by his Bible. Sacred ground, popper and popper. Whether anybody loves me or not, I'll please him. I want to do that which pleases him. If the Baptist turned me down, the Methodists, the Pentecostal, upon their initial evidence, speaking in tongues, being the Holy Ghost, that's the reason we're not Pentecostal. We don't believe that speaking with tongues makes you uh, filled with the Holy Ghost. No more than we believe... <coughs> Living in a barn would make you a pig. No, sir. No more than we believe living in a, in a king's palace would make you a king. Doesn't. You could be a servant. You could be anything. No, sir. We believe that you receive the Holy Ghost by an experience. 
not by mythical intellectual conception of the scriptures, but by an experience that you alone know. Now, if you want to know whether it was the Holy Ghost, watch how your life patterns after that. It'll tell what kind of a spirit come into you. You might speak with tongues and you might not. But why did the Pentecostal do such a horrible thing as that? Why did the Pentecostal do that? Why? Because in the beginning, when God began to restore back then 40 years ago, bringing back the gifts, somebody began to speak with tongues, and speaking in tongues is the least gift, according to Paul's teaching, of the entire bunch of gifts. The least of all the gifts is speaking in tongues. And as soon as they did it, they all got excited and made a denomination and called it the General Council, which is the Assemblies of God. Now, I've talked to some of their best men, their best theologians, and they say, Brother Bram, you're right, but what can we do now? If we didn't raise up against that, we'd be kicked out. And what would our church think about us when we've taught them for years? We've taught them for years that the evidence of the Holy Ghost is speaking in tongues. Why don't we change it now? That's a curse of denomination. Uh, Bless the Lord. We have no denomination. Uh, Just as the Spirit leads, we take it. Uh, The baptism of the Holy Ghost is a personal experience. Uh, I've seen people speak with tongues. I've seen witches and wizards. Any missionary knows the same as ever dealt in witchcraft and devils. I've seen them stand and speak in tongues and throw dirt over the back of their heads and cut themselves with a lance and speak in tongues and interpret it. And you say that's the Holy Ghost? Certainly it isn't. It's a devil. Jesus never said, by their tongues you shall know them, but by the fruit you shall know them. And Ephesians 5, 1 says that the fruit of the Spirit is love. Joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, gentleness, patience, meekness, faith, temperance. Is that right? There you are. Now, if you're a Methodist, those kind of fruits follow you. That you're not quick-tempered, that's fight above us all. If you got patience and you got love and your consideration to everybody. If your first love is Christ, your second is your fellow man. Let you be third down like that. If you're moving on, got long suffering, gentle patience, faith, my, you say, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And there is the divine healing. The Holy Ghost is the same today. Ah, you say, wait a minute. I'm taught in the Church of Christ. Days of miracles is past. You got a devil. Amen. That's right. You say, well, um, uh, we got to be baptized. In the Bible, there's no such a thing as being baptized in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. I see it right now. It's in the Scripture. It's the name of the Lord Jesus. Everywhere it's the name of the Lord Jesus. Wait a minute. We'll kick you out of the assemblies. You duck down to that. You've got a false spirit in you. You're listening to a false teaching or a false prophet. Now you just find one place where there's ever baptized in the name of Father, Son, Holy Ghost. And I'll give up to you. I'll show you every place they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Now, who's right? The assemblies or the Bible? If you say, well, I've been sprinkled. Bless God, that's just as good for me. You just don't have enough education. I tell you, sprinkle. What difference does it make? The pour water on or burst it down. I don't care what, the, what it looks like. The Bible said to be baptized and baptized means to be immersed. Amen. You say, what difference does it make? Well, what if... If God told Moses, take off your shoes, you're on holy ground. Moses, that's too much trouble. I'll just take off my hat. Got to unlace my shoes. Would have been just as good. No, sir. God would have never spoke to him until he took off his shoes. God will never speak to the church until it comes back to the articles and principles that Christ laid down. And it's not dominated by some emotional or some denomination to pull it this way and that way. He'll have to come back to believing in miracles, believing in signs, believing in the Holy Ghost, baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And all these things will have to come back to that or God won't speak to them. That's exactly right. That's where the church is. That's why we're not denominationals. That's exactly why we don't belong to denomination. We believe the Bible. And then there's lots of things in there that we don't know. Plenty of it. But we're standing open, Lord Jesus. Just reveal it. And we'll walk in the light. 
It's a beautiful light that comes where the dewdrops of mercy are bright. Shine all around us by day and by night. Jesus, the light of the world. Not the Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, but Jesus, the light of the world. All ye saints of light proclaim, Jesus, the light of the world. Then the bells of heaven will ring, Jesus, the light of the world. Everybody in a form of worship now. We walk in the light. Beauty is holding me to. Come where the dewdrops of mercy are bright. Shine all around by day and by night. Jesus, light of the world. Wouldn't you rather have Jesus and His Word? And to have any denomination's idea about it? How many would rather have Jesus and His Word? Not find one place in here where God ever ordained a denomination. Find one place He ever put a woman preacher, ordain one in the Scriptures. Find one place that any person was ever sprinkled or poured. Find one place that anybody was ever baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Any words, anything but the name of Jesus Christ. Not Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Find where one person is ever baptized in the name of Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Come show me. Where every person was baptized in the name of Jesus. Now we're going on into deeper things than this now. Now we're going into the initial evidence and so forth. Into the, just see where it's at. Now if they teach contrary to that, they're teaching things that's not in the Bible. Remember, I'm asking you for one place that there ever was a denomination. Just show me one. Then somebody's wrong. I'm not asking to be one here and one over here. Maybe if the other one wasn't. I'm showing, show me one place there's ever denomination. 300 years after the death of the last apostle. Show me where there's one denomination outside the Catholic Church starting it. Show me one place that the Bible doesn't condemn denominations. Then why are you a denomination? Show me one place. Now, one place, one place where any person was ever sprinkled for the remission of their sins. Now, and I don't mean just one here and there, but I show me one place in the whole Scripture. Show me one place in the whole Scripture where anybody was ever poured for the remission of their sins. Show me one place where anybody was ever baptized in the name of Je- uh, uh, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Just one place, one person. Where one person was ever baptized in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Show me one place where God ever put a woman preacher in the church or he ever said for her to be. Where's it at? That's a big challenge. But I want to find your question now. Laying on the pulpit, show me where one of these things are. Tonight, I apologize. If it isn't, then if you haven't met these requirements, then why not meet them? Come be one of us. You are anyhow, potentially. If your name is on the Lamb's book of life, you'll walk in the light. You'll see the light. God will reveal it and you'll walk in it. That's exactly right. See? Now, what I'm not taking you back to a church, I'm taking you back to the Bible. Now, what did Paul say? What did Paul say? If an angel from heaven preaches anything else than this, let him be accursed. God said, let every man's word be a lie and mine be the truth. So I don't care what any church says, Pentecostal, Baptist, Presbyterian, God's word is truth. Why did they start this? On account of denominations. The Pentecostal assemblies of God today would give anything right down to the bottom of them great teachers' hearts if they had never started that dogma of initial evidence speaking in tongues. They know that's wrong. It won't hold water. Certainly won't. I can prove to you by God's Bible that you don't receive the Holy Ghost by speaking with tongues. It's not in here. Or oh, you think, yes, yeah, sure, it's written so close to deceive the very elected. Amen. See, he's hid it from the eyes of wise and prudent and reveal it to babes. It's a spiritual revelation. You watch the revelation, hits it, watch it bright now. See, there you are. See, there's the thing you want to watch, friend. See, is there. We thank God for the Holy Ghost who is our teacher. 
And he doesn't just go out and get some little old mythical idea and bring it up here and say, oh, hallelujah, here it is, right, wrote right here, hallelujah. The Holy Ghost goes back and brings you right down through the Scripture. Places are right down, right on through the Scripture. See, that's when you got the truth. It's exactly, for precept must be upon precept upon precept and line upon line upon line. That's the way the Bible said to do it. You say, do you condemn denomination? No, sir. Do you condemn women preachers? No, sir. Do you condemn speaking in tongues? No, sir. Do you condemn these people who's baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost? No, sir. No, sir. But I say, if they know better now, God will hold them responsible if they don't follow in the life. You might not know it until just now, but you know it from now. See? Now, if you don't think it's right, search the Scriptures and then find your place and come back and lay it on this desk tonight. And we'll see whether it's right or not. And you go search it with an open mind, open heart. Now, that, now this teaching like this is for the Branham Tabernacle. See, just here, just right here. It's not, I wish it wasn't Branham Tabernacle. I wish it just called the Tabernacle. Didn't even have my name attached to it. Well, I'm fixing to turn this church. You all know when we bought it, I bought it when I worked for the public service company. And put this thing up here and it just called it that because that Brother Seward and them attached my name to it when they put it on the deed down there. Just as soon as I can get clear of this thing that we're in now, this church is going to be turned over to this a community and just given my name taken off of it. I don't think my name ought to be on that church. It ought to be a Branham Tabernacle. It should just be a church. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ or something like that. The tabernacle of the Lord. See? The dwelling place. This house of prayer or something or another. Given some kind of a name. Let the congregation choose their name. My name, I'm, I'm just a man. My name don't deserve to be on this. Not more than nothing. The reason I had to put my name on this is because my name was on the deed. It said Billy Branham. See? And it shouldn't be there. No, sir. It should be a community church. This, this should be to the, the congregation here. And this church is sovereign. There ain't no board of trustees or deacons going to tell you what to do. This church and the whole vote tells you what to do. It's exactly right. If there's a decision, if you don't like your pastor and these two or three people get something against the pastor, they can't raise up if they're deacons, trustees. They just don't what officer they are here. They just got one vote. That's all. If he's assistant pastor, he's just got one vote. He's just like the lay member that sits back there. The whole vote of the church settles the matter. And that's right. That's, that's right. No deacon board put a pastor out or no pastor put a deacon board out. The church does that in the general vote of the whole thing. It's sovereign in itself. We have no bishops. We have no general overseers. We have Jesus. Amen. Amen. He's a bishop. <laughs> He's a general overseer. He's a head pastor. He's the king. He's the Lord. He's a healer. He's all in all. And we're just his subjects walking in the light. Amen. And he set some in the church, what? In the church, in the body. Set some in there, what? Of first apostles. That's missionaries. We got one here in the church now. A little boy sitting back there, a friend of mine. Brother, I call him Creech. Okay, Jeffries. That's the first highest call, a missionary. You say an apostle is a missionary? Absolutely. Go look in the dictionary and find out what apostle means. It means one cent. Go look at what a missionary means. One cent. Same thing. The highest order is a missionary who travels the seas for the Lord Jesus. Uh, first apostles. Second prophets. What is a prophet? A seer. Not one that makes out, not an apostle that makes out like he's a missionary, stays home, but one who really is a missionary. A prophet. A seer. Apostles. Prophets. Teachers. Evangelists. Pastors. That's what the body consists of. In that local body, then, there's nine spiritual gifts. One of them is wisdom, knowledge, divine healing, speaking in tongues, interpretation of tongues, all these different gifts that's in the local body. And these apostles, pastors, teachers, and evangelists are all here to be sure that in these gifts, these things are working right. If they sign something false, raising up, quickly they condemn it. Because it's not according to the Scripture. Let somebody walk up here and say, That's God, I got oil in my hands. Look here. You know, I, I, I believe I got the Holy Ghost. Now I got oil in my hands. You'll hear somebody say, That's not scriptural. Amen. That's right. Let's take and go here in the room. Let's search the Scriptures through. Show me the Scriptures where that's at the evidence of the Holy Ghost. Once in a while, I spoke with tongues. I got it. Show me the Scriptures. That's the evidence of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> that's right. Oh, the Lord called me to preach, says some woman. Show me in the Scriptures she did that. Yeah. Oh, I know the Lord told me He blessed me that night I was baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Show me the Scriptures where you're supposed to do that. 
Well, I'm just as good as anybody else, and I'm a Methodist or a Baptist or a Presbyterian, I'm Pentecostal. Show them in the Scripture where God said that. <laughs> That's right. It's not there. There's a wide open challenge to you members of this tabernacle. There's a wide open challenge. Now, if you find one thing that you think it's wrong, as I've said this morning, one thing is contrary to the Scripture, you're duty bound to lay that on this pulpit this evening. That's right. You bring it and lay it here. Show me the scripture, the verse in the Bible where that there was a denomination that Jesus made a denomination or any of these things that I've taught where he ever ordained and put a woman in the church as a preacher where he ever ordained sprinkling, pouring, or, or anything of that type that I've been talking on. Put it here. And then tonight we're going, in, if the Lord willing, to the baptism of the Holy Ghost and into the seat of the serpent and of the woman. All right. The Lord bless you. How many feels good? Oh, I feel like traveling on. Oh, I feel like traveling on. I sing that real sweetly to the Lord. Heavenly home is bright and fair, and I feel like traveling on. Oh, I feel like traveling traveling. There's been one thing since I've been on this rest period for these few weeks. I found out that's been a trouble with me. And I want to confess it now to my church. I sat back behind those oak and hickory trees down here studying. Where did I make my first mistake? What made me go wrong? What was it? You know what I found out what makes me wrong? There's such a thing as going overboard with something. Did you know that? You can try to be all right and try to be good and then you can be too good. And I've just let people push me around. See, they'll say, well, Brother Branham, you come over here. The Lord told me to tell you this. Well, all right, Brother, here I come. Oh, Brother Branham, don't you go over there, over here. Well, maybe I better not go there. See, and you don't know what to do. That's what makes me nervous. I'm going where the Lord leads me to go, and I don't care what anyone says about it. See, That's exactly right. So I won't hurt feelings. And then I notice another thing. My children up there has become a bunch of neurotics. Screaming at night and everything. People piling in and out of the house there all the time. People coming from everywhere. I don't blame people from that, sick people. But we've got that all arranged. And you're at the church when I come to hold a meeting. Well, I almost have to slip out. Get out of the church because people is holding on and this and that. I'm so tired and sometimes coming out of the healing service and I'm not real good to them. Say, say, Brother Bram, the Lord said, yeah, when we come over here, go there. That's no good. I shouldn't do that. We don't have to do that. Now we've made arrangements to take care of that. And I just remember, anybody that wants, I want to see everybody. I want to have time and talk with people. This way you can't, you get somebody in there and first thing you know, all your time's gone to one and, and you, you don't get to see the other one. And that's not right. People come from a long ways just to have a few words with you. Amen. And if God has, has given those people that faith in me to believe that they deserve a little time to be taught. Amen. You shouldn't just turn away and say, oh, I don't see nobody. That ain't right. Because I'm afraid to do it because someone comes and says, Now the Lord tells me, Brother Branham, that you should do a certain, certain thing. This, this is the will of the Lord. Now, the Lord will tell me His will. Yeah. Mr. Everybody. King, how many remembers Ari King? Yeah, Used to come you. here, he's down here. He said, I was building a boat up there one time. He said, Now, Brother Branham, you build that boat according to your own specification. He said, I was building, or some man was building a boat one time, and a guy came along and said, You ought to cut these gunnels this way. Well, he tried it that way. Another said, Oh, you ought to do it this way. Everything, the, the ribs and everything, the boat and should be this way, and the bow should be this way, and the head and the stern and the, the rudder. And he said, It's the awfulest looking thing you ever seen when he got on. Said, He just took the boat and packed it back in the backyard and started out with his saws, cutting them another. Said, Somebody come by and said, Say, This is the way you ought to build it. Said, That one is built. By others instructions is that in the backyard I'm building this according to the way I think it ought to be built. That's right. Amen. Now, God, if He wants me to do anything, He'll tell me what to do. If you think that I'm wrong in what I'm doing or anything like that, you pray for me that God will straighten me out. See? Because I can't listen to too many. Now, you here, maybe at the church, you just got to listen to maybe one or two people. But here I'll go into the tens of thousands. 
how can I do it? Then I said, before I make any man an answer, I'm going to sit down and study over it right. See which way the Holy Ghost leads. Then I'm going to tell him or tell her or whatever it is, and that's my decision. I'll stick by it. That's right. Stay right there. Now, interviews are fixed. Anybody that wants to see me? Perfectly all right. If you call Butler 21519, just look at the telephone directory and find William Branham. Butler 21519, arrangements will be made for interviews. It'll be put down. It's exactly the time and a place to do. And I can meet every person, see with them, help them with their problems and things. But I can't just go and stay a day with one, four or five hours of this, and next day miss the whole thing. We have so much time. We ask them what they want, how much time, and bring it right down. And we see every person. We got that. And the man that answers the phone will be Mr. Mercer here or Mr. Gold sitting right there. And they'll fix that right on the book exactly for the interviews. And I'll see every person if it's a special case. If it's doing time of the prayer service now for the sick, bring your sick and afflicted in. And let them listen a night or two. Now, we'll pray for them emergency cases. But then after about a couple nights, I want to start in on my new ministry. Now, I want to take them back here in this room because you know the vision. How many remembers the vision? Sure you do. Yeah, of the little tent in the room. Now, I'm going to take media in with me on the first night on account of sending women in. And then if it, see how it works just with her in there. And then if it don't work right that way, then I'll turn around and send two women in at a time. Bring two women at one time because they're coming into a place where it's just a man, see? And that, of course, uh, we got clean minds, but the devil don't have it out there, see? So what he'd think about, see? And what the world would say. But it's a ministry that I can't let be known to the public. No one will ever duplicate this. See? No, sir. No. I know it's right on the merge. I can just look like it's reached out there and take a hold of it. It's laying right there. Last night I was dreaming, just before I got up this morning, Brother Neville. Hey, I, I was dreaming a dream. And I thought the ministry, I don't know what it was doing, but whatever it was, oh, 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 you talk about things taking place. I've never seen such. I woke up just crying out, praising. I hit my wife in the face with my hand like that. Like, it's a praising God. And there, oh, I, I just know that there's something right out here just ready to reach over and get a hold of it. Hey, it's going to be greater than it's ever been. It's going to be wonderful. I believe God's fixing to do something great. But now we got to approach it sanely, intelligently, and right in the Word of God. Uh, Correct. Right. Oh, we love it. I remember, if any of your friends or anybody wants to see me and wants to talk with me about a little something that's privately, let them call Butler 21519, and there will be an interview arranged out at the place. I can't have them around the house up there and around the tabernacle here, because you get in here, I preach real late. And I stay here because I'm not with you very much. And I just hold you as long as I can to get every word in. Because, friends, this is the only time that we're ever going to have to do this. This is all going to be over pretty soon. We're going right on down the valley. Right on down. Look at him. It's left since last year it's been here. See? So we're going down the valley. We've got to do this now. This has got to be done now. And I, that's the reason I hold you. You say, well, that, how about scripture for that? Yep, Paul preached all night one night. A man fell out of the building and killed himself. How many know that? Yeah. All night long. Paul went over and laid his body up over him, felt him. His heart began to beat with that guy's heart. Said, oh.